All right, if you want to take your Bibles and open them to Daniel chapter 12, Daniel chapter 12, our text today will continue our study of Daniel's eschatology because it's part of the vision chapters, but it's also the very last section of the book of Daniel, so we will be concluding our formal study of the book, um, and I've titled this today's message, uh, The Conclusion. Sounds like a good title, eh? For the last part, the conclusion. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, once again, I ask that you would open our hearts and minds to understand your word today. Speak to us in our, uh, in our own unique situations and strengthen your people. Increase their faith and fill them with your love. And if there are any of you who are listening today who do not know you as their Savior, Lord, I just pray that you would draw them to yourself in repentance and faith. We especially ask that you would save our children. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so with your Bibles open then, follow along as I read. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4 to 13. Verse 4. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others stood, one on this bank of the stream, and one on that bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream, How long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it will, would be for a time, times, and half a time. And that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. I heard, but I did not understand. Then I said, O oh my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? He said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act, wick, act wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. And from the time that the burnt, regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. But go your way till the end, and you shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. So verse 4 is actually part of the vision from 10.1 to 11.12.4. Uh, that all forms one complete part. The angel here speaks directly to Daniel and tells him to shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. So the time of the end that he's talking about here is not, is not during the Ptolemy and Seleucid conflict, um, as 11.27 tells us, it says, For the end is not yet uh, to be at the time appointed. So that's not the end that he was talking about. So the time of the end is not when Antiochus IV Epiphanes sets up the abomination that makes desolation in 11.31. Uh, nor is it the revolt and the Jewish victory of the Maccabees in, in 11.35. For it says... For it still awaits the appointed time. The implication there is the appointed time of the end. But it is the time, by our context, it is the time of the Jewish rebel king that we discovered historically uh, could very well be John of Giscala, who led the Jewish rebel forces against the Roman armies during the Roman War from 67 to 70 A.D., and that included the general Vespasian, who eventually became Caesar, and then Titus, 
and his uh, general from the south, Alexander. So the time of the end then is described for us in verse 40 uh, as being uh, the time of the end of the city of Jerusalem and of the temple. Uh, it's the, in 70 AD. It's the end of God's indignation against the nation Israel and, uh, and the Jewish people. It marks the end of the Sinai Covenant. It marks the end of the sacrifices and the Aaronic priesthood. It marks the end of the transgression of the Jews. It marks the end of sin. It marks the beginning of the fifth kingdom of God. It marks the beginning of righteousness. It marks the fulfillment of the Old Testament visions and prophecies. And it marks the enthronement of the anointed one who is Jesus himself as the king over the kingdoms of men, as the true temple, and as the prophet greater than Moses, who leads his people through the second exodus. And if you haven't figured it out by now, you should understand that when the Bible talks about the first exodus, it's about the nation, of the people of Israel, the Jewish people, the Hebrews actually, got to get the terminology right, Back then they were known as Hebrews. The Hebrews brought them out of Egypt in the Exodus so that they would come to Mount Sinai, receive the covenant, and become the nation of Israel. And when we talk about the second Exodus, it is when God leads his people, the people of faith, um, out from the, the bondage of sin, and they become his people by faith in Jesus Christ. So the second exodus is an image and a picture of salvation. So the, this verse here, again, verse 4, it brings us back to the reality. So um, it brings us back to that time when Daniel heard these things that were told to him. So it's in, in essence going back to the beginning of chapter 10, where it tells us that he was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris River, in 10.4. And um, they returned then to the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, in 10 chapter 1. So the vision took us from that time, the third year of Cyrus, all the way through to 70 AD. And now at this point, the, um, the vision is bringing us back to Daniel's point of reference in uh, um, as the third year of King Cyrus. So Daniel is told here in this verse that he is to write down all of the visions that he has been given and, and he is to seal them up in a book until the time of the end. So again, uh, until the time that the anointed one comes to the time that the city is destroyed. That's when the books are to be opened again. Now at this time, some of the Judean people had already returned to Jerusalem um, but life was hard for them. There were no homes, uh, no wall protecting the city where they lived, and of course there was no temple. They were trying to rebuild its foundation, but it's, it was very difficult. Uh, the, the work of rebuilding their lives was proved to be a frustration, uh, very slow and difficult uh, in the face of powerful opposition from the Gentiles that had moved into the area, but not specifically into the city of Jerusalem. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah, they tell us that they continued to struggle uh, with the same sins as before. And nothing had really changed at all. So physically and spiritually, their lives were in hardship, which is part, again, of God's indignation against them. Because remember, the whole time in Babylon, this whole uh, time of exile, is God's judgment on them for breaking their, the covenant faithfulness and uh, disobeying God. It's very important that we remember that, that uh, um, God is punishing them and he's bringing them to an end through this, uh, this judgment. So the command here to seal the book is really a command to protect the writings. So it's not just a matter of putting it in a book, rolling it up and putting a seal on it, although that is part of it, because, but it involves this idea of protecting it Keeping it safe. So in other words, write them down, Daniel, and keep them safe and protected so that they can be opened at the time of the end 
to be a, uh, a time of, uh, of faith and renewal for the people who are going to go through this. God's people need this word, especially as they get closer to the time of the end. Uh, the word of God will make them ready so that they will um, not be taken by surprise when the Messiah comes and, and when the Romans come, both of those things. Jesus himself quotes from Daniel to prepare this generation of the Jewish war for the desolation that would come. Uh, if you recall in Matthew 24, he said, uh, uh, he quotes from Daniel and then he uh, uh, then he says, those who, have, those who listen and read this uh, understand. So this is, of course, the same for every believer of every generation. So for you and I, it's a lesson we can understand. As time rolls along, as we are getting closer to the second coming, we, we can also become more discouraged and, and wonder whether it really is going to happen. And the doubts could begin to come in. But as time rolls along, we need God's Word to make sense of life and uh, to make sense of the circumstances that we go through and, and how it relates to the end. God's Word has been preserved, it's been protected for us, so that today we hold in our hands the written Word of God, translated into English for us, so that we can understand. So the protection of God's Word brings our understanding. And that's what he's partly referring to when he says that in the end, uh, understanding will increase. Um, do we understand just how important this book is? Sometimes we, I think we forget. And without it, we cannot make sense of this world. So the book of Daniel then as never assumes that we would find living in this world um, to be very easy. Never assumes that at all. On the contrary, it anticipates uh, bad days. It anticipates uh, times of persecution. It anticipates that there would be an ebb of flow and of good and bad, of the rise of evil and the fall of evil. It anticipates that governments would be evil and there would be governments not as evil. All of this is anticipated until the time of Christ. And when we have God's word and understand that, then we can make sense of the things that are happening in this world. And we are waiting then for Christ to return. And if, um, and if we are not prepared for it, then we might find ourselves crying out in despair, How long, O Lord? Where are you, Lord? What are you doing, Lord? Why is this happening to me? But when we have God's word, we understand. So God's given us every revelation that we need to be prepared for whatever comes our way. So remember that when and if you ever go through times of despair and circumstances which would tempt you to question God. Remember this, that God has given us his word that we might understand what is happening. Now, this last phrase of verse 4 is actually, verse four is actually a very difficult phrase to understand. It, it says in our translation, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Uh, on the one hand, that kind of has a negative meaning to it, and it means that the people are, are going to go about living their lives uh, and not really care about what is happening. And, and they will continue to question God. And they will continue to, to doubt and to not have faith. And they don't really care about God. But it's also telling us that when the end comes, and they go through this time of destruction, then they will remember, and they will know. Their understanding will increase. It's also it's kind of the same ideas in Philippians <laughs> Philippians chapter 2, okay, chapter 2, 9 to 11, where it says that uh, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Okay, it, it's saying that whether you are a believer or a non-believer, there's coming a day when, when everybody is going to have knowledge here that the Jesus is the Lord. Whether you believed it or not, you're going to know. Your, your knowledge is going to increase. So that's kind of the one idea that, that uh, some scholars think. On the other hand, th this... Um, uh, um, this phrase could also refer to, to the result of the time of the end. 
So what it is saying here is that when people go through this horror, um, when they go through this horror of the destruction of Jerusalem and of the temple, then it is telling us that they will actually turn in faith. That it's a positive thing that people actually will come to Christ. There will be a knowledge of God and, and a knowledge of Jesus will increase as a result. There's a, a third possible understanding of this phrase, and that is that when the time of the end arrives, they will have Daniel's writings to help them to understand. So again, it's putting it right back into the context of verse 4, that he is to preserve it for that time. And so it's telling us that when that, when that time comes, they have the word of Daniel written there, and they can open the scrolls, and they can read about it, and they can see that God predicted this hundreds of years before it ever happened. And, and they can read about the, um, the fiery furnace and about the lion's den, and they can understand that God, the Most High, rules the, uh, the kingdom of man and sets the kings that he wants to be in place, that he is in control of everything, and he is a sovereign God. So then they will take from that uh, uh, hope and um, during, during that time. They'll understand. Their understanding will increase because they have the word of God, because it was protected, because it was preserved for the people at that time. And, and this is what Jesus actually for, refers to in Matthew 24, verse 15. Again, he quotes from Daniel, and he says, let the reader understand. So the disciples in the early church um, did understand. And, and it tells us that, that, especially the way Luke puts it in his gospel, where uh, he says, when you see the armies surrounding the city, then you know that this is the time to get out. It's the warning. And Jesus uh, warned them in Matthew 23 and 24. And he says, so when you see this happening, then uh, be warned and, and, uh, and get out of the city and be saved. And with that and connected to the writings of Daniel, they were able to, to be saved. And, and uh, it's reported that there were no Christians in the city of Jerusalem at the time of its destruction. So they, they uh, did understand, the Christians did, and their understanding increased as it got closer to 70 AD, and they started to understand what Daniel was writing about. And after it was all over, of course, the prophecies of Daniel really made sense to them. So you and I can look back now, because we've already come through the history, and we can take the Word of God, and we can take the history, and we can see how they mold together, and, uh, and there's an exact fit. And so we can be um, prepared for the future, our future, of the things that we don't see and don't understand, and uh, be warned about them as well. So if you want to just turn in your Bible to John 12, 16, because this is a, an interesting verse, uh, John 12, verse 16. Uh, Jesus was coming into Jerusalem riding on the, the donkey. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, when he came into Jerusalem riding on the donkey, it says there in 12, 16, his disciples did not understand these things. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> his disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified. In other words, they understood when he was glorified. So after the ascension of Christ, then they can look back and go, oh, yes, it makes sense. Now we understand. And that's the same position we are. Just flip over to the next chapter, John 13, verse 7. Jesus says there, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. He was talking specifically about washing the disciples' feet and the whole message of the, the, uh, the Last Supper uh, and about his death and the covenant and all that stuff. He says, right now you don't understand this. But uh, afterwards, when it's all over, you will understand. So, you, so it's good to know that when we have the, the Word of God and we have history that lines up to it, that it creates greater understanding and that creates faith for the future. And uh, so when, when we went through the vision chapters of Daniel, and especially chapter 11, we were able to understand what the angel was talking about because we, we, have, we have seen the fulfillment. We have the records of the fulfillment. We know the history. 
So the content of chapter 11 makes sense for us. Even though it doesn't name names, we can put names to the whole chapter as we, and we did that as we went through it. So it's true that one day the wicked will understand and every knee will bow to King Jesus. But the righteous understand now. Why do we understand now? Because we have God's Word, right? We, we know the prophecies and uh, we have the record of their fulfillment and these things give us understanding. We know the history. Uh, <clears throat> this knowledge is the basis of our hope in the promises about His own return to us. And so we, um, we face tomorrow based on what God has already done in the past. And we have understanding. So Daniel was told to preserve these visions and prophecies because the people near the time of the end are going to need them to have faith and understanding. And those after those things have been done will know that God predicted it long before it happened. And faith and understanding will be the gift to all who believe. So you see, this Bible prophecy really is not difficult at all uh, when you understand it. All right, verse 5. Verse 5, it, it's difficult to know whether there was actually a time span between, uh, verse, between the vision from, from verse 4 and earlier uh, and verse 5, uh, or whether it's actually the continuation of the, the uh, same vision. <clears throat> so the word then can imply that there was a time lapse, uh, or it can imply that it's a continuation. And, and so we don't really know. Um, but we do know here that Daniel is back in, at the Tigris River. Uh, whether we woke up from the earlier vision, or whether it's a continuation of the vision, or whether it's a totally different day, um, it, it, again, is uncertain. Um, I, I'm of the, uh, the feeling here that, that it is actually a new vision but it's really close to the close of the, the, the previous vision. So in that sense, it doesn't really matter if it's a continuation or not. So it's kind of really a, a mute point. Because the whole conclusion is referring back to that vision. So if there is a time lapse, I don't think it's very long, simply because the question refers back to the two crises um, mentioned in chapter 11. So here we have Daniel is, is down by the river again, and he looks out and as he, as he did in 10.5. And, but this time he sees two other beings besides the man who is clothed in, in white clothing. Um, they're standing on, or clothed in linen, they're standing on opposite sides of the banks of the river. Now it doesn't tell us who they are, but the, uh, probably one of them is that second angel that, that uh, talked to, to Daniel, who uh, a lot of scholars think might be Gabriel, the same Gabriel who, who uh, gave him the vision in chapter 9. Uh, who this second person is, we don't really know. But uh, the, the man clothed in linen, uh, who we determined when we looked at it, was, may have been a pre-incarnate Jesus. He's, he's there again as well. And uh, he's described as being above the waters of the stream. Now, how many of you, as soon as you read the word above, thought above as in, in space? He wasn't down here in the stream, but he was actually above the waters. How many of you thought that? Okay, how many, that, that, that you can think that, but it doesn't really make sense. We don't understand it. But the, the word that is used there actually can mean um, um, upstream. So it's, he's, a, he's not where these two guys were on each side of the bank, but he was upstream from them. He was above them in the stream, uh, the, meaning that he was a little bit upstream from them. Uh, it, it almost gives you a picture, if you think about it, of, of the crucifixion, doesn't it? Jesus was in the middle cross of two other men that were on his sides. And I'm not sure that we can really conclude that that's what's there, but because we understand and know the New Testament, it's something that popped in my mind and reminded me of the crucifixion of Christ, that Jesus is there uh, and um, <clears throat> in the middle between these two men. So verses, verse 6 tells us that one of these angels, one of these angelic beings, asked the man clothed in linen a question. And again, I'm just intrigued by the fact that the, the records of the crucifixion tell us that one of the, the men on the cross turned to Jesus and asked him a question. Uh, the question he asked was, uh, um, uh, will, will I be uh, in your kingdom? 
And uh, the question that is asked here in verse 6 is, how, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? Now the word wonders is, is not referring to something that's wonderful, um, something that's great and beautiful, but it is actually referring to, when, we talk, when the Bible talks about the wonders of God, it's talking about the, the mysterious aspects of God, the particularly the judgments of God uh, upon uh, mankind. So it's really the, the bad things, but it's a wonder because we don't understand these things. Uh, the way God deals with his people is called a wonder. So in this context again, so it is referring to God's judgment uh, at the time of the end. So it's the judgment on the city of Jerusalem and of the temple uh, that he's talking about. And so he's asking him, how long will this judgment at the end last? Of course, he's re referencing the time, the time reference is 1136 to 45. So the man clothed in, the, in linen, he gives the answer in verse 7. He raises his hand, right hand and then his left hand towards heaven. In other words, he is giving an oath. He's swearing by God, he's giving an oath. And uh, when someone does that, uh, um, you take him at his word that this is truth. And you can trust what he is saying. Uh, it, uh, so he says well, how long it will last. Look at verse 7. It will be for a time, times, and half a time. That when the shattering of the power of the people, the holy people, that is the Jews, comes to an end, all these things shall be finished. So this period of time was already mentioned or revealed to us back in chapter 7. So you could quick flip back there quickly to verse 25. Chapter 7, verse 25, and, and it's referring to the 11th kings. Remember the, the, uh, the beast, the fourth beast uh, had 10 horns, and then uh, an 11th horn came up, and after three of them were, were um, uprooted, and this 11th horn then uh, comes up, and he makes war on the Jewish people. And, and, uh, and it says there in verse 25, He shall speak words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change the times of the law, and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. So Jesus himself is giving his word here that the time of the end, this time of the destruction, this time of the intense uh, judgment of God upon the Jewish people in the city of Jerusalem and the temple that uh, uh, it will only last for three and a half years. Isn't it good to know that Jesus, that God has planned history and the events of history to an exact period of time? I think it is. Uh, the very fact that it's it's three and a half years um, tells me that there's that there is some specific planning here. It's not just a little over three years. Uh, there's not question to it, but it, there's an exactness. Now, I don't know if we can take it to be exact, although if you look at history from the start of the Jewish-Roman War in 60, the spring of 67 to the, um, to the end of the summer in uh, 70, that's pretty close to three and a half years. It's almost exact. Um, so there's, there's some truth in here, and I think that it's trying to tell them particularly prior to it happening, that uh, not only is God in control, but he's in control of minor details. And it will be a short time. Now, I don't know if three and a half years is, is really a short time for such a period of time of destruction and horror, but, um, but in comparison to other wars, I suppose it, it is. And, and, and this is exactly what Jesus was referring to again in Matthew 24, verse 22. Matthew 24, 22, and if, if those days had not been cut short, that is to be only two, three and a half years, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So Jesus is referring to that uh, very testimony from Daniel. So it's not a vague period of judgment, but one that is predetermined by God down to the very day that it will end. Note in verse 7 here that he clearly defines what it is that comes to an end. Uh, first he says it's the power of the holy people that comes to an end. Okay, the power of the holy people, it's the power of the Jews. 
Uh, this is the nation of Israel. God is finished with the nation of Israel. They have fulfilled their role in the redemptive plan of God for the salvation of the na nations. See, the temple is no longer required. The sacrifices are no longer required. The, the laws are no longer uh, the law of the land. The traditions are no longer to be kept. So they, they've completed their place in history. There are shadows which point now to the realities uh, of Jesus, who is the true Israel. Uh, he's the only Jew that ever kept the law perfectly, and he's the true temple. As uh, Stephen said, and as others said, that uh, it's no longer a temple made with hands. It's no longer a physical temple, but it is a living temple that God dwells in Jesus. And it's only those who join him by faith that are his people. It's no longer by nationality, but it is by faith. So the nation was an, was a, an example uh, and a type, but the reality is Jesus being true Israel and the temple and those who have their faith in him are the true people of God. So I just remember, remind you again of Galatians chapter 3 verse 7. It is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And Romans 9, 6 to 8, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. This means that it is not the children of the flesh, that's the natural Jew, who are the children of God. Okay, the Jews are not the children of God anymore in this respect. But the children of the promise are counted as offspring. So those of faith. So it's when God then shattered uh, the, the power of the Jews the, in 70 AD that they came to an end. When God destroyed their city and their temple and their covenant relationship. So that's the first thing he identifies. The second thing he identifies is that all these things will be finished. So there's the end of, of the temple and of Jerusalem, but there's all these things will be finished. Well, what are the all these things? So again, if you, you work grammatically through the context, um, he's referring here to the visions that Daniel is told to seal up. All of these visions that were given to him in chapters 2, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, then 10 through 12. All of these visions and prophecies concerning the time of the end um, are also going to be finished. They will be fulfilled um, and, uh, at that time. So there's nothing more from Daniel that needs to be fulfilled. It's already been complete. And again in 924, Gabriel said that at the end of the 70 weeks, both vision and prophet will be sealed. And here the word sealed is used in the sense of fulfilled or completed. So right here God tells us that everything in Daniel's eschatology is fulfilled in the events of 70 AD. All right, verse 8. Verse 8 says that Daniel doesn't understand. Now, sometimes what we do is we immediately think that well, what, he, what he doesn't understand is the timing of the end. Well, that's really not difficult. It's pretty clear. It's only going to last this long, and these things are going to happen. And um, we need to understand that it's not the vision that Daniel doesn't understand. It's not the timing of the vision or of the desolation that he doesn't understand. It's not the end of Israel that, that Daniel doesn't understand. It is what happens next that Daniel doesn't understand. Okay? He understands that this is the end of the age of Israel, but he doesn't know what comes next. And so he's questioning him and asking him, um, asking the man clothed in linen, a question in verse 8. Oh my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? Okay, he, says, he says, okay, I can understand all of this that you've given to me, and, uh, but I don't understand what's going to happen next. What's going to happen to these people that were your people? And, and they're no longer that your judgment is complete upon them. What is the outcome? And uh, the man in, in linen uh, gives his answer, although it's interpreted by the angel giving the vision, um, in verses 9 to 13. So let's take a look at this answer. The first thing he tells Daniel is that no more revelation is going to be given. No more revelation will be given. So he tells Daniel in verse 9 and again in verse 13, he says, you go your way. Go your way. He's telling Daniel to go about living his life. Uh, he, he should go back to being that... Uh, the, to his job as the administrator in the courts of King Cyrus, and, and he's reminded that the vision has been shut up and sealed. 
It's already been shut up and sealed. There's no more visions to come. So this is the first thing he says. So Daniel, you don't need to worry about this. The revelation's completed, and uh, you know all that you need to know. Secondly, he tells Daniel in verse 10 that many will be saved. See, it's been kind of a gloomy picture that he's been giving him up to this time. He says that the, the, the uh, fourth kingdom is going to wage war on the Jews, is going to prevail. Many are going to be lost. God's anger uh, upon their covenant unfaithfulness, it will be tremendous. It will be a time of horrendous horror, none like has ever happened in this world before. And uh, it says, says you don't want to be there. God's going to shorten that time just for the sake of the elect, so that some people will be saved. And this is what he says in, in verse 10. But as bad as it is, Daniel, I do want you to be encouraged because some will be saved. Some will be saved. Even though the judgment of God brings the end of the nation of Israel, Many of the Jews will be saved. They will, in fact, turn to the Anointed One. They will become part of the new kingdom, the fifth kingdom. They will be forming a new nation of true believers in God. And as we know from the New Testament, that it is a nation made up of Jews and Gentiles. So that in God's kingdom, there is no Jew, there is no Gentile, there is no slave, there is no free, there is no male, there is no female, all of these different things. But the kingdom is made up of many people. As Isaiah uses the phrase in Isaiah 53, the many, the many will turn to him. So in verses 11 to 12, he gives some advice now for those who, who, are, who are actually going to go through uh, the crisis that chapter 11 has identified in the third kingdom. Uh, so it's important we understand this. So, so far, in the first question, he's uh, when the um, angel asked the man in clothed in linen, how long is it going to be? He said three, three and a half years. That's referring to the, the Roman conflict in AD 70. So now, in verse 11 and 12, he's actually going to go back, and he says, let me just say something here about the, uh, the Greek conflict in uh, 167 to 64. And, uh, and so he's specifically referring to that crisis. Uh, in verse 11, he quotes 1131, uh, which is referring to the burnt offerings being taken away and, and the phrase, the abomination that makes desolate. So from the, it's almost an entire quote of 1131. So we know specifically that this is the conflict with Antiochus Epiphanes IV that he's talking about. And the advice he's giving here is, uh, is that he's already reminded Daniel that the crisis of the Romans will last only three and a half years. So he tells him that the crisis with Antiochus IV of Greece is only going to last 1,290 days. Okay, so it's, it's a little more than three and a half years. In fact, it's, uh, it's three years and seven months by that dating. But in verse 12, he tells him, but you should wait another 45 days. So now we, we don't know exactly what these days refer to in, in terms of the history, um, but they, they seem to be warning, uh, it's, they seem to be a warning to the people living at, the, at that time that the crisis will last from the, the taking away of the burnt offering for 1,290 days, which is three years and seven months. But they should wait until the 45th days which is 1,335 days, eight years, or three years and eight and a half months before they start celebrating. So in other words, and, and, and what a lot of scholars think is that at the end of the 1,290 days, that's when Antiochus the Epiphanes the fourth, or Antiochus IV Epiphanes dies in 1, uh, 149. And uh, when the back Maccabees fought against him, and uh, they uh, and they rededicated the temple. And this is really the only place that we have any kind of a date, and that is in the book of Maccabees. It talks about uh, the re the consecration or the rededication of the temple after the Maccabees had cleansed it, and that happened on the 25th day of Kislu in the year 148 B.C. So some make the argument that the 1290 days covers that period from the stopping of the burnt offering. Until uh, the death of Antiochus in 149, and that the additional 45 days takes them to the rededication of the temple. 
uh, since the consecration of the temple, it's the only date that, uh, that we can say for certain. We don't really know the exact date that Antiochus died. We don't know the exact date that the, um, the offerings were, were stopped, the purged offerings were stopped. So that's, that's one solution that is put in there. Chapter 8, verse 14, it actually, in one sense, complicates it because it's referring to the same event, if you remember. And there, the, um, uh, Daniel asks the angel who's given the vision in chapter 8, how long is it going to be? <laughs> how long is it going to last? And he says the crisis will last 2,300 uh, mornings and evenings, uh, which works out to 1,150 days. So now we're going, well, now always, what you're talking about? So again, we don't know the time frame of reference for the exact dates of these things and how they fit together, but all three of these datings are close to the three and a half year mark. Some a little longer and some a little shorter. And, and for various reasons, it's, it's, it's giving these dates. But they all seem to start at the, at the, the time the burnt offering is, is stopped. And, and so the people that need to know and understand this the most are the people actually who go through this. And uh, so to us, it really isn't all that important. It's not something that we need to spend time on. It's not something that we need to, to really understand, except to know that God is giving a warning for his people so that they can be prepared for the, the events that they're going to go through. So it's very possible that only those who were, who, who were there historically know exactly what, uh, what is meant by these different days. <clears throat> And again, they have the book of Daniel with them. So they open the scrolls, they read it, and they have these days from this. this. So they go, okay, here's this thing happened today. Today in history, Antiochus stopped the burnt offerings. Ah, that's what Daniel said. Now we need to count the days. And they count the days, and they're prepared for what has happened. And, uh, and their faith is strengthened. And we need to remember and think back that the that God has strengthened his people by giving him this kind of detail. So God encourages Daniel that many will be saved while many will perish, and he warns them for the sake of their salvation. So God was gracious to them while he was issuing his judgment upon them. Isn't that an amazing thing about God? He's gracious at the same time as he is judging their sins. Um, that just, and that's the way God has been all along. He sends a prophet, and the prophet says, God has given me a, told me to tell you that he's going to punish you for your sins. And he's going to do it in so many days. But he's going to let you have a chance to repent before it happens. And if you repent, he won't bring the judgment. If you do, don't repent, then you can expect the judgment to come upon you. God is gracious when he gives judgment. And that's what he's doing right now. You know, when Jesus rose from the dead and ascended to heaven, he could have ended it then. He could have ended it then. Basically, everything was already over. The kingdom was inaugurated. But he could have consummated it at that point. So what's he doing? He's building his kingdom through grace. He, he is... Oh, Mike just went off, didn't he? So he, he's building his kingdom through grace. He's, he's trying to... Um, get people to, uh, to, to hear the gospel, to know the gospel. He's warned them, the day of judgment is coming. How many times do you, have you, you hear of people who are at various sports events or other things and they're holding a sign saying the end is near, the, 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 the day of judgment is coming, all those kinds of things, right? And, and people are being warned that the end, is, the end is near. But why has it happened yet? Because God is being gracious. God has been gracious to those who haven't heard yet, so that they might hear and be saved. Well, let's come to verse 13. Because uh, <clears throat> Verse 13, of course, is the verse that we have ended all of our messages with. And uh, when it reads, But go your way till the end, and you shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. Now, I've been implying that this is a verse to us, and, and which it is. But, but directly and in context, it's actually to Daniel. So when he says, but go your way, he's saying, but Daniel, you go your, go your way. And, and it's kind of a, a, a reminding him again in verse 9. He says, everything's done. You've got all of the prophecies. You've got all the visions. I've told you everything you need to know. Now all you need is faith. But uh, go your way. Continue to live your life. 
Live your life based on the Word of God. Live your life based on the promises that I've given and, and, uh, and the warnings that I've given. And uh, he, he uh, dismisses Daniel with the comforting assurance that after his life is over, and that's what he's talking about, till the end, this is not until the, 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 the time of the end, to the destruction, because Daniel didn't live to 70 AD. <laughs> okay, if you're thinking that the end here is the end of the temple, no, Daniel would be mighty old. He's already in his, uh, his 80s at this point in time, and uh, he, he's never going to make it to 70 AD. Uh, he's talking about the end of his life. He says, you live your life until the end of your life comes. But rest assured that when you die, when you rest, that uh, you shall rest. But also know this, that you're going to stand. And, and here he's referring to the resurrection that he talks about in uh, back up in verse, uh, um, verse 2, chapter 12. The resurrection, the, the kingdom of God is, is the, 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 the main element, the main thing to know about the kingdom of God is it is a kingdom of, of life through resurrection. And uh, he will rest in the grave, and from the grave he will rise to life. That's what he's telling him. And when you arise on that day of resurrection, you will be given your place at the end of the days. There, this is the only time in the book of Daniel that he goes to the end of the age, the end of the world. Because he, that's the day of resurrection. And he's telling him there, so you will stand you will have your allotted place. You will be there, Daniel. You'll be there when it's all over. When everything is done, you'll be there and have your place. Well, let me give you some couple of things in conclusion here. This age, then, is revealed as a constant period of refining and of testing. It's a time of ongoing and great tribulation in which only God's grace sustains His people till the end. Uh, it's going to be followed by another age, an age of glory, an age of rest for those who have been found faithful. Uh, it's an age to come that where the wise will shine like the brightness of the sky above. Okay, there's a rest that awaits Daniel after his earthly work is done, and it's a rest that awaits us after our lives are done. If we persevere by faith, through God's grace and doing the things that God has asked us to do in this broken world, then there's a glorious eternal rest that is prepared for us where our sin will be done away with, uh, our guilt will be, will be removed. Uh, in that age, our brokenness will be fixed forever along with the brokenness of this world. If, however, we choose to abandon faith, to ditch the truth, we will rise to judgment that will end in our shame and everlasting destruction. There's no middle ground here. And, and the gospel message of Daniel is so clear. There's no middle ground. You can't earn your way to, to heaven. You can't earn your, your uh, God's uh, righteousness towards you. You can't be good enough for him to, to, to give you salvation. There's no one that is good enough. Your destiny depends on whether your name is found in the book of life. The, you know, the, the whole book talks about the abomination. The abomination of the land, the abomination of the temple, the abomination of the city. All of these different things. And in chapter 9, verses 26 and 7, it implies the abomination of the, the anointed one. All of these things. And, and that is the greatest abomination the greatest abomination of all time was when wicked men laid their hands on Jesus Christ. When they took the body of God's new temple and they spat on him and they slapped him and they whipped him and they kicked him and then they hung his body on a cross and they mocked him. Was there ever a greater display of the brokenness in man than we see on the cross? And even the brokenness of the man, Jesus Christ. Yet it is in the body of Jesus on the cross that all of our brokenness was healed and restored. It's through his brokenness that our iniquities are atoned for and our sin is taken away and the guilt is removed and righteousness is brought in and the kingdom of God is established and a new nation is, is created made up of believers who are, uh, have a new covenant relationship with God 
and a new heart and a new spirit. And all who put their faith in the work of Jesus Christ and believe that God raised him from the dead will be saved. They will have their names written in the book of life. They will receive the inheritance which God, which is ours in the kingdom of God for eternity. So the question is, how are we then to live? Well, the first answer is that we are to we only start living when we turn to Christ. But as broken people in a broken people in a broken world, we need to live. No, remember that we live between two times: the cross and the and the resurrection. As Daniel, that's the day of resurrection. As Daniel waited for the Messiah to come, we're also waiting for for Messiah to come again. Uh, where we're called to go our way, to live our lives, to and to live them by truth, the truth of what God has written. Everything's been written down for us. It's here. It's complete. There's nothing more to be added to this book. We have it all. We know everything that we need to know. And we can understand. We have that understanding. We can look at life and interpret it by this book. And, and uh, this book tells us that God is sovereign over the kingdoms of man, that he's planned every detail, that he punishes sin, and he rewards faithfulness. So we need to be faithful to the truth. We need to be faithful to God. We need to be faithful to His Word. We are to pray and persevere as Daniel did. Never grow weary for doing what is right. We should rejoice in the suffering and the resurrection and the ascension of the Son of Man, who not only reigns on the throne of heaven and earth, but He is the first fruits of all who trust in Him. <laughs> okay, this is something to be really happy about. His resurrection is the guarantee of our resurrection. And uh, we need to keep our eyes then on the inheritance which is ours. If Jesus could endure the cross for the sake of the, sake of the, the joy that was set before him, then we can endure the circumstances of life with our eyes firmly fixed on Jesus and the heaven which is the, the joy that is set before us. And never forget that the day of is coming when Jesus Christ will appear at the portals of heaven just as he went before. So he shall come again and the portals will open and every man will see him. And God will raise us at the last trumpet to our allotted places where we will stand forever at the end of the days with Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that through your word you have prepared your people for anything that could happen in this world. We know that circumstances will vary for individuals and for countries, but your truth will always stand. Jesus Christ is the king who reigns over the affairs of this world. We also know that there's a day of judgment coming in which all who are in rebellion against you will be brought before the court of, of the Ancient of Days, and they will receive their eternal a reward. Oh, Father, I pray that there is not one who is listening to my voice today, anyone who has not come to Jesus for salvation, that they will be drawn to you and, uh, by repentance and by faith. Lord, I pray that you will build our hope as we study your word and give us the faith to believe and live and persevere and understand everything that's going on about us because it's made clear in your word. We wait in anticipation then for your return. So we worship you and we uplift your name. And we sing of your wondrous deeds for you are the great and awesome God who keeps his word and steadfast love to those who belong to you. Therefore, Lord, hear our prayer. And do not delay in your coming. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, just, let's all read this verse together knowing that it's also a promise for us. Ready? But go your way to the end, and you shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. You feel the hope? Isn't that awesome? Okay, God bless you. Well, let's close our, our service by singing... Um,